Second lecture in this series on Machen and the Presbyterian controversy. Today, I want to cover what prepared Machen to fight. Um, and this is a way of ta talking about Machen's biography, his, his family background and education and related topics. Um, so I'll start with his family. Uh, Machen was not your a fundamentalist for a variety of reasons. One of them because he came from elite an elite family in Baltimore. Um, he's not the sort of these weren't the sort of people that produced fundamentalists. Um, he um, his father was a prominent attorney in Baltimore. Um, when I was doing my research for my dissertation. I believe that his father tried more cases than any other attorney during that era. Um, and when I served um, <clears throat> jury duty in Baltimore, when we were living there, when I was in grad school, walked into the main room of the courthouse, and there was a portrait of Arthur Machen, Machen's father, on the wall. So he was a man highly regarded in, in the town. Um, he was the son of Louis Machen, who was a clerk for Congress before the Civil War. Um, so they lived in Washington before, um, uh, that's where Arthur Machen grew up, Machen's father. And they have a home, they had a home in Centerville, Virginia called Walney. And it's actually a place that people can visit. It's, a, it's part of the Virginia uh, Parks Commission I assume it's still standing, that they haven't taken it down with some of the other statues in, in Virginia. Um, <clears throat> and there is actually an intersection there near the home of Machen and Lee. Lee Road goes one way, Machen Road goes the other, so you can actually find that intersection. On the Gresham side, so J, J. Gresham Machen, Gresham is the family name of his mother, uh, his mother's maiden name, Mary Gresham Machen, also known as Minnie, wife of, author, of Arthur, about a 15-year gap, I think, in age between them. She was a socialite, a hostess. She was also an author. She wrote a book called The Bible in Browning, published by Macmillan in 1903. She was by no means a slouch in any regard. And her father, <clears throat> she grew up in Macon, Georgia, her father was an industrialist, particularly with getting railroads going in Georgia. He was also a mayor of the town of Macon, and his, her father also served on the board of trustees of the University of Georgia. So I guess if I were to root for college football, I should root for the Georgia Bulldogs. Um, and the town home of the, of the Gressoms is now a four-star B&B in Macon. It's called the 1842 Inn. So people can visit Walney and see where the Machins spent some of their time. They can go to the 1842 Inn in Macon and see where the, the Gressoms lived. All of this is to say is that Machin was a Southerner. His parents were Southerners. Machin didn't spend a lot of time in the South, although he did go with his mother uh, to Georgia during a couple weeks in the South where she would homeschool the boys. Um, his, his orientation was much more Baltimore, and Maryland has a, an unusual sort of relationship with the Union as well as the South, but still Machen's outlook was Southern, and people will often try to associate Machen's fighting in the Presbyterian controversy with the way the Confederates fought in the Civil War. Um, now, just to give you a little flavor of how Machen regarded his parents, he, Machen wrote a, uh, in 1931, an autobiograph autobiographical piece. So this is what he wrote about his father. My father was a profoundly Christian man who had read widely and meditated earnestly upon the really great things of our holy faith. His Christian experience was not of the emotional or pietistical type, but was a, qu was a quiet stream whose waters ran deep. He did not adopt that touch not, taste not, handle not attitude toward the good things or the wonders of God's world, which too often today causes earnest Christian people to consecrate to God only 
an impoverished man, but in his case, true learning and true piety went hand in hand. Every Sunday morning and Sunday night and on Wednesday night, he was in his place in church and a similar faithfulness characterized all his services as an elder in the Presbyterian church. So Machen's father was devout, very much observant and a, an elder in the, in the Presbyterian church there in Franklin Street, Presbyterian church in Baltimore. Machen went on to write about his mother. Even stronger was the influence of my mother. Like my father, she was an exceedingly wide reader. Her book on the Bible and Browning is only one gleaning from a very rich field. Her most marked intellectual characteristic, perhaps, was the Catholicity of her tastes. She loved poetry with a deep and discriminating love, but she loved with equal ardor the wonders and beauties of nature. Long before the days of outlines of science and outlines of everything else, she was a student of botany and also a student of the stars in their courses. I shall never forget the eager delight with which she used to stand with me when I was a very young, when I was very young upon a ridge in the White Mountains and watch the long shadows creep upward upon the opposite heights. She loved nature in its more majestic aspects, and she also loved the infinite sweetness of the woods and the field. I suppose it is from her that I learned to escape, sometimes from the heartless machinery of the world and the equally heartless machinery, alas, of church organization. So Machen couldn't refrain from taking a little dig there at church politics. And then one last little reflection that confirms his Southern outlook in a way, um, and this could trigger some people, so I guess I should couch this with a warning, but he, he talks about going to visit the home, his mother's home in, in Macon. I'm very glad that, in my, glad that in my very early youth, I visited my grandfather's home in Macon, Georgia, where my mother was brought up. I should mention, by the way, that if anyone does go to the 1840 Inn, if it survived COVID, um, they will see pictures of a little boy dressed in a dress. Some of these images are of Machen himself because the people who own the inn kept a lot of the, the, um, the decorations there. So anyway, Machen went there as a boy. Its fragrance and its spaciousness and simplicity were typical of a bygone age, with the passing of which I am convinced that something precious has departed from human life. In both my mother and my father and their associates whom I saw from time to time, I caught a glimpse of a courtlier, richer life and a broader culture than that which dominates the metallic age in which we are now living. It is a vision that I can never forget. So Machen was perhaps insensitive to other realities in Southern life, but he was very much um, predisposed to a kind of uh, genteel, uh, uh, elite sort of society. He hung out with a lot of elites during his time, thanks to his family's position, um, he, he knew Woodrow Wilson first. I mean, I think he called him some kind of uncle who was president of Princeton when Machen was teaching at the, at the seminary. Of course, he became president of the United States. He knew um, the president of Johns Hopkins University, where he went. Uh, but they, they vacationed with the Rockefellers up in uh, Mount Desert Island in Maine. Machen was part of the Protestant establishment as informal as those categories could be. He had two siblings, Arthur, his older brother, the first of the children, uh, went into law. His younger brother, Thomas, um, was a, uh, an architect. Um, not a lot survives about the, um, the younger brother. His older brother, Arthur, took, a, took an active hand in, in preserving a, a number of aspects of um, Machen's papers and his estate, etc., as you might expect from a brother, but also an attorney. So where did Machen receive his education aside from growing up in the home and having parental influences? Machen did not go to a Christian school. He went to a private academy in Baltimore, um, and he, that prepared him to go to Johns Hopkins University as an undergraduate, um, 
Johns Hopkins was a revolutionary institution in the history of American higher education. It was the first university dedicated to research, dedicated to pr uh, producing PhDs in various academic disciplines. And this means that undergraduate education could was sort of an afterthought at Johns Hopkins, even though Machen did go there and, and received a first-rate education in, in the classics. He was a major in the classics as an undergraduate. Then he stayed for to do a year, a master's degree in the Greek classics. Um, <clears throat> and he studied there with one of the foremost classicists of, uh, uh, in America at the time, Basil Gildersleeve who was also an elder at Franklin Street Presbyterian Church. So has a small town feel in some ways that where Mankin, uh, Machen was, was living. And it's a very different world from where Mencken was living, who was alive at the same time. Um, it took Machen a while to decide upon a career. Uh, it took him a long time. In fact, when he graduated at, with his master's degree, he didn't really know what to do. He, think, he thought about studying banking. He thought about studying law. Um, but he eventually wound up at Princeton. Almost it seemed like something to do instead of having to find a job. And he liked to um, have fun. So I'll just read briefly from something that I wrote about. Machen in my biography, which, which I think humanizes him in a lot of ways, because again, the way we remember him is as a fighter, especially people who agree with him, think of him as a hero, but he was also a very human being, and he, and he, he enjoyed life. And I, I think sometimes we, we tend to forget about that. He liked to ice skate, he liked to play tennis, he liked to go to uh, football games that, that the university was, was uh, engaged in. Um, so, this is something from my, my biography. At Princeton, Machen detested that class attendance, this is the seminary, was required and often cut classes to take in a college football game, a lacrosse match, play tennis, ride his bike, or ice skate on the Delaware Canal. As exams approach at the end of his first semester, Machen showed no greater interest in the course of study. In one letter to his mother, he reported as if boasting that he had flunked an Old Testament exam, even though he eventually discovered that he had passed. The excuse he offered was that the professor didn't seem to ask anything that we had been over in class, but everything else in Hastings' dictionary. While preparing for exams at the end of his middle year, he protested to his mother of being chiefly afflicted by the boredom of the thing and looked forward to the happy day when the last of the nauseating series had been left behind forever. Even his intensive work in New Testament exegesis, for which he won a $100 fellowship, which was a significant sum at that time, he called a trifling matter. When he discovered that only two students had entered the contest, he considered refusing the fellowship. If Machen's studies at Princeton did not engage him, his recreation certainly did. A reliable index to his interest as a seminarian comes from a letter he wrote to his father at the end of his first year at Princeton. He complained that we had one of the most abominably long and tough exams I ever experienced in New Testament, and the trouble has just begun. Apologetics Monday, Theology Tuesday, Old Testament History Thursday, <clears throat> Old Testament Canon Friday, uh, and then a course at the university on Saturday. <clears throat> For the last exam, he wrote, I haven't even done the outside reading. Machen's spirits brightened considerably when he thought about life after classes. He continued, <clears throat> on Friday night, we have the annual Benham dinner. On Saturday, this, is, this was an eating club where he was a member, on Saturday, if I get through my exam in time, I expect to go to Swarthmore to see the game. Not sure which game it was, but he was going to see a game. The week from next Monday night comes the Benham Alumni Dinner, which I shall, of course, attend. I then expect to stay over a few days to take some rides by, on his bike. He liked to ride up to New York City, actually, to see plays and buy books. Indeed, it is in some ways too bad that they closed the seminary so early because we missed the pleasantest and most interesting part of the Princeton year. 
a number of the fellows are going to stay over to read and study and have a good time. And I should certainly like to, very much to join them for a week at any rate, at least till after the Pennsylvania baseball game, which will be a great event. If I were not so anxious to see the Hopkins Crescent game on the same date. So probably you will see me turn up a week from next Saturday, Friday or Saturday. This is all about his plans when he's going to leave campus and come home. But he has he needed to stay to see a lot of a lot of activity to have a lot of fun. Machen did like to have fun. <clears throat> um, and if I have actually given a talk called "Putting the Fund in Fundamentalism," and and Machen, you you could you could argue that he he did that. Um, after his studies at Princeton, he graduated with a bachelor's of divinity. It was then only a bachelor's, bachelor's not a master's degree. He went to Germany to study for a year, one semester at Marburg University, and the second semester at Got Göttingen. But he also still liked to have fun. This is how he describes some of his um, antics to his brother, younger brother, Tom. He writes, yesterday I took part in another characteristic form of amusement. At 2.30 p.m., a crowd of us with ladies went by train to Kelb, a little town about 10 minutes from Marburg, and there we proceeded to make a day of it. Coffee drinking, cake eating, and other kinds of drinking, and other kinds of eating, filled up the intervals in the dancing, which continued till about 11 o'clock in the evening. I tried the dancing once, but only once, as in the first place. The thing is done very differently from the way it is done in America. And in the second place, I never could dance very much anyhow. However, I had a mighty good time, and the informality was refreshing. It may not look very elegant to dance in plain, ordinary suits of clothes on a floor quite innocent of wax, but it suits me better than that awful stiffness which in America makes an entertainment a horror. So Machen liked to go out and have, and crowds, as it were, but if, um, in a very refined way. He was a member of what was the equivalent there in Germany of a fraternity uh, where w the people with whom he, he, he uh, took, took part in these re revelries, as it were. <clears throat> um, he did mention that even though he was out very late on a Saturday night, he did get to bed in time to get up to go to church on Sunday. So he didn't abandon church life even while he was carousing. It's really quite something to, to contrast um, Machen with uh, Abraham Kuyper uh, and, and the sorts of restrictions on piety that some of the conservative Dutch Protestants experienced. Kuyper was, um, was responsible in part for the Christian Reformed Churches taking a stand against, in the 1920s, a stand against dancing, playing cards, and going to theater. And these were all things of what, in which Machen um, participated and, and very much liked to do. In fact, he, um, he wrote in one of his letters to his parents that he liked to play bridge with some of the other Princeton faculty, but they had to do it secretly because if the students learned that they were playing cards, piety being what it was among American Protestants or American Presbyterians at the time, they would have been upset that they were playing cards. Um, <clears throat> so that's the family background and his education. One last aspect is church life. He was a member, grew up at Franklin Street Presbyterian Church. We've heard that his father was an elder there. Other faculty at Hopkins were elders there as well. It had been an old school church. It had identified with the old school Presbyterian tradition, but by Machen's day it was probably probably becoming more Victorian than old school, more genteel and cultured than strictly Presbyterian. And Victorianism, if you want a, def a definition of it, it was characterized by three doctrines, and this I take this from a very good um, intellectual historian, Henry May, who wrote about this, but it was defined by First, certainty of moral values. Secondly, a belief in progress. And thirdly, a belief in culture, especially high culture, uh, pointing up to, to higher things. And <clears throat> there's nothing, 
Machen, Machen was very much a participant in that kind of Victorian culture, but that wasn't what he thought was the way the church should operate. That that shouldn't necessarily characterize the church himself. And his pastor, um, more when he was in 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 university and at seminary, Harris Kirk, the minister there, was much more attuned to this Victorian outlook than say other earlier pastors had been who may have been much more old school. Um, and so that's something to keep in mind that the transition is happening even in old school churches uh, while Machen is uh, a younger man. Um, but he still grew up, inherited much of the old school Presbyterian faith. And again, what characterized pre old school Presbyterianism was subscription to the Westminster Standards, Presbyterian polity, and Reformed piety. Um, and that, that will be important for um, defining Machen's life in many respects and recovering aspects of that old school outlook. <clears throat> um, so one last point to consider with this um, background of what Machen, what made Machen a fighter. Um, after studying in Germany, where there's, there's a lot of debate about the degree to which Machen experienced a crisis of faith while in Germany. Uh, he, he, he was studying with liberal Protestants, some of the foremost liberal Protestants of the day. One of these um, professors was also a very influential professor upon Karl Barth, who studied also at Marburg, not, not at the same time, but both Barth and Machen were very much indebted to their experiences in Germany. Um, and uh, Ned Stonehouse, one of his Machen's biographers, talks about a crisis of faith. You can look at the correspondence that Machen had with his mother. You can maybe get a sense that she was worried. But I looked at this and saw it also, at least, if not a crisis of faith, as a crisis of vocation. Machen really didn't know what he wanted to do. And because his family came from business, law, even his other brother going into architecture, were professionals. They weren't academics. They didn't have experience being ministers. And I do think Machen saw what was expected of pastors and the kind of restrictions on them because of conventions of piety and whatnot, that he maybe didn't want to go into that or be in church circles. So I think it was much as much a crisis of vocation as it was one of faith. But he, when he comes back to America in 1906, he starts to teach at Princeton as a lecturer, not as a, as a faculty member, because you needed to be ordained to be faculty. Uh, he wasn't ready for that step, but uh, his, his, um, his faculty member who regarded him quite highly, William Park Armstrong, encouraged him at least to come back and be a lecturer. So that's what he did um, in 1906, and he's teaching Greek New Testament, uh, Greek um, language, um, and this is where he has a period between 1906 and 1914 of working out his, his calling. Um, so this is also 1914, the beginning of World War I in Europe, America doesn't enter until 1917. And this is going to be something that's going to be an important development in, in Machen's life. But I will stop here for now because this is going to be another part of, of Machen's development as a fighter, is his experience of World War I, thinking through the issues involved, even serving um, in Europe during World War I, but we'll talk about that in the next lecture.